join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we can lift our praise and worship up to you, Lord, declaring who you are, Lord. And of course, giving you thanks and praise. Lord, this time, together in your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, Lord. We thank you so much for this time. It's, it's so important. Would you speak to us, Lord, and clarify what it is that you have this evening in your word. So we thank you, Lord. We praise your name. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing tonight? Blessed? Hi, Linda. All right. Those of you online that are joining us, we're so glad that you are. We're continuing our trek through the Bible, and we are currently in the book of Daniel, going through a chapter by chapter, verse by verse study. And tonight, Lord willing, we're going to complete chapter two. Been very much looking forward to uh, the passage before us here at the end of this uh, chapter. We're going to pick it up in verse 24. We left off, of course, last week in verse 23. But in the remainder of this chapter, the king of Babylon, who <laughs> has anything he could ever want, and then some plus more, worries about everything that could happen to everything that he has. It's been said that the more you have, the more you worry about keeping what you have, or losing what you have. So he is fearful and worried about what's going to happen in the future. And the reason is, is because of a very disturbing dream that, more like a nightmare, <laughs> a recurring nightmare, uh, that God gave him concerning his greatest fear about his future, and not just his future, but the future of his kingdom. Because see, he is the most powerful man in the known world. He rules an empire there in Babylon that has conquered the known world. And he is so powerful, has everything, riches unimaginable. So what does he have to worry about? He doesn't have to worry about paying next month's rent. He's got all this wealth. So what's he going to worry about? Keeping it. What else is he going to worry about? What's going to happen in the future with him and his kingdom? How long will this continue? How long will his kingdom last? Is there another kingdom coming after my kingdom? Enter Daniel, who God supernaturally reveals, as we saw last week, not only the king's dream, which was the prerequisite, that they told him first the dream, then the interpretation as a validation and verification that they weren't just making up the interpretation. In other words, you're not going to just interpret the dream, because you're just going to say whatever if I tell you what my dream was. So how about this? You tell me what I dreamt first. They're like, nobody can do that. Only the gods, plural, <laughs> can do that. That's, that's supernatural. And I'm sorry for the illustration, but I just pictured Daniel, who wasn't invited to this party, going, oh, 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 choose me. Because <laughs> I know God who can tell you what your dream was, and God would reveal to Daniel what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was, and then the interpretation of the dream yet future. And as we're going to see, it confirms his worst fears. What's his worst fear? His kingdom is not going to last forever, as powerful as he is, and as worried as he is about his kingdom in the future. Now, we're going to see this, of course, throughout the book of Daniel. There's so much 
in its prophetic implication, but I don't want us to get muddied down, I guess for lack of a better way of saying it, in the prophetic implication, but the personal application, because there's a takeaway here for us in this. And it's namely that of the utter futility of worrying about the future, which is an absolute waste of valuable and irreplaceable time. Let me say that again. A minute spent worrying is a minute wasted, and it's a minute lost. You will never get that minute back ever again, or that hour, or that night, staying awake, worrying. When I was a kid, I'll never forget this. It, it scarred me for the rest of my life. My dad walks by and he goes, well, it was at the end of the day. We're all getting ready to go to bed. He goes, there goes another day never to be lived ever again. I'm like, wow, that's so dark. <laughs> but it's so true. It will never, it's gone. There's no way to recoup that time. It's over. We can never go back and say, you know what, do over, no do over. So here I am taking this valuable, irreplaceable time, and I'm worrying, and I'm fretting, and I'm fearing, and what a waste of time. I mean, what, what does it accomplish? Jesus in Matthew 6 said, what, what is worrying going to do? You think it's going to add height? Hair? <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's move on, because we have quite a bit of, of uh, really looking forward to this. But again, it accomplishes nothing. It's a waste of time. And here Nebuchadnezzar is, here's a guy that's got everything, and he's worrying about everything. He lacks for nothing, but he's worrying about everything. So one more thing before we jump in. We're going to include the link to our prophecy update back on November 28th of 2021. Wow, three years ago almost already. It was titled, The Last Ruling Empire of Man, and it was based out of Daniel chapter 2, which we're going to see tonight and study tonight. And in it, we look at the prophetic significance of specifically the ten toes which is a prophecy about the final rule of 10 kings over 10 kingdoms at the end of time. And it's a mixture, though they don't mix, of iron and clay. So now Daniel is going to interpret this dream about this image and when we get to Daniel 7, we might actually revisit what I'll affectionately refer to as the Ten Toes prophecy of Daniel, because it comports with John's Ten Horns prophecy in the book of Revelation, which we just so happen to be going through verse by verse on Sunday mornings. Now please, there's no way, unless God does it, that we're going to time the time that we're in Daniel 7 at the same time that we're in Revelation 17. I mean, God, God is able, but I don't want you to get your hopes up. There's quite a bit in Revelation, and we're taking our time, if you haven't noticed. We're still in chapter 1. All right. I need to kind of give you the backstory before we pick it up here in verse 24, because we left Daniel last week praying and praising and thanking God after God had revealed to Daniel in a vision, not a dream, a vision of what the dream was that Nebuchadnezzar had and what the interpretation of that dream was that Nebuchadnezzar had. And curiously, Daniel does not rush to Nebuchadnezzar, because as he's getting this vision, they're killing all the 
Chaldeans, the magicians, the sorcerers, the astrologers, of which Daniel was one, considered one, these interpreters. And Nebuchadnezzar was infuriated and issued an irreversible edict to kill every single one of them, unless and until they could tell him first what the dream was, and then what the interpretation of that dream was. So Daniel seeks the Lord, asks for time, and prays, and God answers. And then when God answers and reveals to him the dream, he just praises the Lord from about verses, I want to say, 18 through 23. And did, do you know that in those verses prior, from about verses 18 through 23, that he quotes no less than 15 verses in the Old Testament. Why do I point that out? Because Daniel had what is, has been called a working knowledge of God's Word. He knew Scripture. When you go back, and we saw this at the end of our study last week, when you go back and you look at that prayer, he is quoting no less than 15 scriptures, starting in Genesis, out of First Chronicles, I think it is, several out of the Psalms. And he's just praising God, thanking God for answering this life and death series, literally. It was a matter of life and death. And he answered Daniel's prayer. And he thanked God before he went to the king. And we talked about that last week. So now we're going to pick it up. He's, he's thanked God. He has the answer. And now we got to get to the king. And the first order of business is to get Nebuchadnezzar to stop killing all these guys, because I've got the dream and the interpretation. So that's where we pick it up. Therefore Daniel, verse 24, went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to, to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Verse 25, I want you to pay particular attention to what Ariok does here. Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man. Wow. Okay. No, you didn't. More like God did, and you're trying to take the credit for it, because you want to be in good favor with Nebuchadnezzar. Because keep in mind now, Nebuchadnezzar is deeply troubled, deeply disturbed. He hasn't slept since. He is very concerned about this dream that he keeps having. What does it mean? Who's going to tell me what it means? So whoever can bring me somebody to tell me the dream and the interpretation, I'm going to show great favor to. And Ariok's going, I found him. I found the guy you're looking for. <laughs> no, you didn't. Nice try. God did. I have found a man of the captives of Judah who, watch this, will make known to the king the interpretation. So far, so good. The king, verse 26, answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, that again, their names were changed. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered, I'm your man. No, that's not how he answered. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he, not me, has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Fourteen times the last days are mentioned. At the end of time, the time in which we live. Only God 
He's giving all the credit to God. He's taking no credit for Himself. To His credit. <laughs> That's a play on words. I would have totally tried to at least say something like, you know, God spoke to me. <laughs> he doesn't, don't do that. He doesn't do that. He completely removes Himself, and it's going to even get more pronounced here <laughs> in a moment. He says, He has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Here we go. Verse 29, As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, <laughs> this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. I'm no one special. Don't, don't think for a second, Nebuchadnezzar, that God revealed your dream and its interpretation to me, because I'm special. I'm wise beyond my years, or anyone else living like me. God looked down upon me and said, I can give Daniel the, Daniel the answer to the secret. <laughs> In other words, what he's doing here is he's saying, it has nothing to do with me and everything to do with God. Oh, we do err greatly. Did you know that we just read the secret to ministry? Never touching the glory. The second you start taking credit for that which God alone has done, you can start the clock. It's game over. It's just a matter of time. Because no flesh is going to glory in His presence. God will share His glory with no one. All the glory is due His holy name only. And He is giving all the glory to God. And if if you'll notice, it's almost simultaneous and easily missed at first read. He's, he's doing both simultaneously. What do you mean? Not only is He giving all the glory to God, but simultaneously He's removing Himself so that no credit can be given to Him. This is not because of me. In fact, truth be made known, this is despite me. This has nothing to do with me. There's nothing special about me. This is all God and only God. And God is the one. Because Nebuchadnezzar's question to Daniel was very specific and very sincere, in all fairness. Do you know? Well, yes I do, but it's not me. It's my God who gave to me for you your dream and its interpretation, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Can you imagine right now what Nebuchadnezzar, he's sitting on the edge of his throne, I mean, bated breath. All right, what was my dream? And Daniel's going to tell him, you, O king, we're watching. And behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome, dude. Oh, the do, dude is not in the original. Just want to make sure you're still with me. You are, right? Good. Verse 32, this image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Verse 34, you watched <laughs> while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. 
<laughs> Again, I'm sorry to, to stop, but I would have loved to have seen the expression on Nebuchadnezzar's face at this very moment. Just can I give you just an example of what I think he's doing at this point? He's probably going, how did you know? I just told you, God in heaven, not me, God. So <laughs> this is exactly what his recurring dream is, to the T. So then, verse 35, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were <laughs> crushed together. No wonder he was disturbed, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That stone, that Reich, Reich, wow, <laughs> rock, rock, Reich. Hang on, let me gain, gain my composure here. That rock is Christ, who sets up His final kingdom and rule and reign on earth, and He destroys all the kingdoms of man. And Nebuchadnezzar saw this very dramatically and was terrified by this, this recurring nightmare. And he, you know how when you wake up from a nightmare and you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. It was so real. You know what I'm talking about? And usually it's because you had pizza the night before. <laughs> no, th there's something to that. Don't eat food before you go to bed, especially. I, there's something about pizza. I don't know what it is. Don't eat pizza before you go to bed. You're going to have weird dreams like this, a big marshmallow is chasing you, and you wake up with your pillow, <laughs> going, whoa, you were chasing me. No, that was just a nightmare. Wow, I'm so glad. But it was so real. Okay, you get the point. I'm just trying to get you into this passage, because you can only imagine how upset he was. No wonder. Well, verse 36, this is the tree. Now, we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. <laughs> you, O king, are a king of kings. Now be careful here. Not the king of kings, a king lowercase of kings lowercase. And here's why. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom. All that you have has come from God in heaven. Now, he's going to learn the hard way, as we're going to see, when he, in all of his arrogance and hubris and pride and haughtiness and conceit, and you can fill in some more words if you want, says, look at this great Babylon that my hands have built. You remember that one? That does not end well for him. And God's like, wait, 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 what? De you, you got a very short memory. I know it was a while ago, but back in chapter 2, Daniel told you that I'm the one that gave you all of that, and now you're taking the credit for this great Babylon that your hands have built? Watch what I'm going to do now. I'm not going to tell you. You have to come whenever that is. Hopefully the rapture doesn't. Well, if the rapture happens first, it'll be a moot point. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, He has given them into your hand, and has made you rule over them all. You are this head of gold. Now you got to know that Nebuchadnezzar is like, Okay, cool, wait, but there's some succeeding kingdoms. And if I'm the head of gold, that means somebody else is going to be the silver and the bronze and the iron, and then the iron mixed with clay. Notice they're inferior, gold being superior, 
So your kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar, is the head of gold. <laughs> but it's all going to come crashing down. And that's what you feared. That's what you worried about. What does the future hold for me, for my kingdom? I want my kingdom to last forever. That's not hyperbole, that's literally. Why do I know that? Because next week, Lord willing, He's going to build an entire image of all gold in defiance of this, as if to say, I'll have the final say on how long my kingdom lasts. If I'm the head of gold, Babylon, my kingdom, then the whole thing's going to be gold, because I want all the kingdom to be mine to rule. So that's next week. You have to come next week. That's chapter 3. That's a very well-known chapter, by the way. Very prophetic, but the personal application is even more profound than the prophetic implication. Because, in fact, I've already titled it. I'll tell you that. Just no extra charge. Next week's title of chapter 3 is going to be God will deliver you from that fiery trial. God will, not might, will deliver you from that fiery trial, as He did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But again, that's next week. I'm not going to teach next week's chapter tonight. So stop trying to get me to teach. <laughs> so you're the head of gold. Uh-oh. But after you, he doesn't want to hear this, shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. I think he's probably, okay, good, I'm superior, but still, I'm not good with this kingdom after my kingdom. I want my kingdom to last forever. So this kingdom that's going to arise after your kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the, all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. So have a nice evening. Have a good night's sleep, if you can. You have your answer. Then he gets to the feet and the toes. And this is so fascinating. Whereas you saw the feet and toes. So now you've got the arms of silver, the breastplate of brass, the legs of iron, and now you've got the feet with the ten toes that are mixed iron with clay, but they don't adhere together. So he saw this in the dream, and now Daniel is interpreting it. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And verse 42, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And I want you to pay particular attention to verse 43, because it's key. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, the seed of men. But they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Hang on to that. And verse 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Notice the conspicuous absence of any mention of Nebuchadnezzar saying anything <laughs> as Daniel is explaining the dream and the interpretation. He's speechless. He's speechless. Now, for those of you that are visual, 
Here's a graphic. I put this together. Be gracious to me. I did my best on this. But these are the empires that God revealed to Daniel, starting with the head of gold. This is the Babylonian rule from 605 to 539 BC. Don't lock me in on these years. The silver arms is the Medo-Persian empire that was inferior, silver inferior to gold. This is 539 to 331 BC. The bronze breastplate was the Greece, Grecian empire, 331 to 168 BC. The iron legs was Rome, the iron rule, 168 BC. And this is up for some debate. Some place it as far as into 476 AD. But then it's this last one. And I put present, not future, and I'll explain why in a second, but it's the feet of iron and clay with the ten toes, the ten kingdoms, the ten kings ruling over the ten kingdoms. Iron mixed with clay doesn't adhere. I truly believe that this is transhumanism, because iron is machine and man is clay. Literally, man was made from the dust of the earth. The 17 elements in the dust of the earth are the same 17 elements in the flesh of man. When God created Adam from the dust of the earth, He literally created Adam from the dust of the earth. So the takeaway for you tonight is, you're dirt. <laughs> Well, God created you. So that was mean, wasn't it? You'll never forget it. But we're clay. He's the potter, we're the clay, right? We're the clay in the potter's hands. This is man. This speaks of man. But what does iron speak of? Machine. This is Klaus Schwab transhumanism, the fourth industrial revolution. We're going to, again, when we get to chapter 7, we'll see. You've got the four kingdoms, the four beasts in Revelation 17. And that fourth, talk about the fourth Reich, not rock, the fourth industrial revolution is transhumanism, the merging of man with machine so that it, that doesn't adhere. And that is the sole goal of the Great Reset. And it's been planned for decades. And COVID was the instrument in the hands of these demon-possessed conspirators. Oh, I've got to be careful. This is on. <laughs> Verse 45. whatever. Daniel continues, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, again this is speaking of Jesus, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. And I love this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. You can take it to the bank. Actually, don't take it to the bank. <laughs> it happened exactly as Daniel was given the vision that it would happen. And this was exactly what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know, what's going to happen. Well, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen after your kingdom, and after that kingdom, and after that kingdom. But there's going to come this final kingdom that will be forever, and it will be the kingdom of Jesus Christ, who rules as King of kings and Lord of lords forever and ever. And He will crush into pieces, and it will be blown to the wind no more like the chaff. It will be gone. It will not last. 
only His kingdom will last. And this dream that I just told you that you had, down to the gnat's eyebrow, and yes, gnats have eyebrows, that specific, and now the interpretation. And by the way, you know that the interpretation is sure. Why? Because I just told you exactly what your dream was. I mean, did I miss anything? No. So I just told you what your dream was, right? Who does that? God. So I told you what your dream was, and then I interpreted it. Pretty good likelihood that it's going to happen. Would, wouldn't you agree, Neb? <laughs> Verse 46. Now, this is, wow. Don't get too excited when you see what he does here. Verse 36, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, <laughs> and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. Now stop right there before we go any further. This is very, very important. He is acknowledging Daniel's God. You got to know that as the most powerful man in the known world to fall on his face, I, I, I see it like this. He is just laying bare. He is laid out. He is, this is probably arguably one of the most, if not the most, astonishing and stunning revelations of his entire life. He fully expected that nobody was going to ever be able to tell him his dream, which is why he became so infuriated and issued the edict that all of them be killed. And then to have this this captive Hebrew slave brought in. Now remember, it wasn't that long ago that he was presented to King Nebuchadnezzar after he respectfully requested to be tested for 10 days, so as to not partake of the king's delicacies, which were sacrificed to idols, which would violate his conscience before God. And he didn't protest. He didn't defy. He didn't, you know, he just kindly, respectfully requested, hey, just can we give us 10 days, let us eat a different food, not sacrificed to idols. We talked about this, and I want to get into the whole vegetarian thing. And after 10 days, why don't you inspect us and see how healthy we look, and then take us before King Nebuchadnezzar. And he does. And King Nebuchadnezzar examines them, interviews them, and notices something about them. They look so much healthier than the other guys that were eating his delicacies. So what does he do? Well, he's very impressed. I don't know whatever you guys did, but now I want all the other guys to do whatever you did, which I think is why they weren't invited to this party when he had this dream. They don't want him, because the last time we had this guy involved, we ended up all having to become vegetarians. I mean, that's pure speculation, but there, there was already tension there. But I mention it because in King Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, he's already off to a good start with Daniel. He's already noticed something about Daniel and his three friends, they stand out. There's something different about them. They're peculiar. They're different. And now this, I almost wonder if Nebuchadnezzar is not asking Ariok, wait a minute, you got somebody that's going to, who is it? Well, I found the guy. What's his name? Daniel. Wait, isn't that the same guy that, that looked so much healthier and that you had me examine? After, after 10 days, he asked the same guy, what is up with this guy? Now he's got the, get him in here. Let's, I got to hear the, 
There's something about this guy. And we're going to see now what Nebuchadnezzar's response is. I just want you to grasp just how, I don't know what the word is. Th this is the last thing you would think he would do, fall prostrating himself before Daniel. Wait a minute, it's supposed to be the other way around. Isn't Daniel supposed to be prostrating himself before this king, this powerful king, that with, he doesn't even need to snap his fingers. All he's got to do, like the locals, raise the eyebrows up with his head. That's it. You're dead. So this is backwards. So what's going on here? Well, the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings. Okay, stop. I'm sorry. To, I hope it's not getting too discombobulated, but I would be grossly remiss if I didn't point out this, what he's not saying. He's not saying your God is the only true and living God. No. He's saying your God is now at the top of the list of gods. There are other gods before your God. Wait a minute, doesn't that sound like the second commandment? You shall not have, or is it the first one? I think it's the first two. Don't make any graven images. Don't have any other gods before me. He just did that. In other words, he's not quite there yet. And don't think that all of a sudden now he's going to start worshiping the true and living God of Israel, because next week, I mean, there's some time that <laughs> elapses between chapter 2 and chapter 3. But uh, next week, on our schedule, he's already defying God. <laughs> so again, don't get too excited here. He's, I guess, as he only knows how, I mean, maybe in all fairness, this is as good as he's ever going to get. Now, later on in the book of Daniel, oh, he knows who God is. He's going to realize that, no, he's not the God of gods. He is God, period. There are, who is like unto you, O God, period. No gods. You're, you're not a God of gods. <laughs> no, I'm God. Don't put any other gods in there. What, I just got ranked number one now? I got rated number one because of this. But there's still other gods before me? Yeah, that's not going to work. But it, you're, you're the Lord of kings. Not exactly. He's the King of kings. And a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Okay, we'll take it. We'll take what we can get from this king. Okay. Now, this is going to be so germane to our understanding for next week. And I need to spend the remainder of our time together tonight on it, because it's going to set the stage, for lack of a better way of saying it. Watch verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel, exalted Daniel to the highest position, the most powerful position in all of the kingdom, next to King Nebuchadnezzar, like Joseph was the most powerful man, exalted next to Pharaoh because he found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh, Joseph, just like Daniel found favor in the eyes of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he was exalted and given all of his power. So he lifts up, promotes, exalts Daniel, and watch this, gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. In other words, you're going you're gonna to rule over everything. I'm going to worry about nothing, because I just I haven't slept in a week since I started having these recurring nightmares. I, I can trust you, kind of like Potiphar with um, Joseph. 
You know, there's a, that's a very interesting, do you mind if I just take a little, a little scenic route? We'll come back, but this is this very interesting. You know, there's some details in the narrative that um, make you wonder about, see Potiphar, when his wife, and by the way, he knew about his wife, but he also knew Joseph, and it had trusted Joseph with all the affairs of his household. He just enjoyed everything and worried about nothing, because Joseph took care of everything. And he trusted him with everything. He trusted him with his life. All of the financial affairs of his house, all of the business, all of the servants, he even trusted him to be alone with his his wife, who he knew. He knew about her. Now, when this false accusation of a, attempted rape reached his ears, do you know what should have happened immediately, without hesitation? Joseph would have been killed on the spot, on the spot. But he's not. Why? Because Potiphar knows. He didn't try that with my wife. I know about my wife. I know it's not in the text, but I wonder about things like this. And people wonder about people like me who wonder about things <laughs> like this. But I just wonder if Potiphar, because he, he, he sends him to prison, which is, don't imagine a prison cell like today. It's a dungeon. You're left there to die. Um, he didn't have to do that, but he wanted to spare his life. I, I believe that Potiphar was, this was a huge loss for him. And he did it with great regret and great reluctance. He did not want to lose Joseph. That was the best man he had ever had to handle all of his affairs. And again, I'm sorry to say it like this, but he knew about his wife, okay? So he knew it was a false allegation, and he doesn't kill Joseph. And by the way, everything is going perfectly according to God's prophetic plan for Joseph. He goes from the pit to the pinnacle, the most powerful man in the known world at the time. God is orchestrating all of this. He's doing the same thing for Daniel, because this is going to again be germane to our understanding of what's about to happen there in Babylon. So now he's been given all of his power to rule over the whole province of Babylon. And he's now the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Oh, great. <laughs> really? He, we've been jockeying for position. We applied for that position. We were all competing for that position. We were trying to find favor in the eyes of the king. And how did you get the job? Because of my God. He promoted me. Uh, there's a proverb that basically goes like this, a, a wise man, a skilled man, will stand before kings, not common men, and will find favor in both the eyes of God and men. And a good name is better than all of the wealth and the gold, to have a good name, a good reputation. Well, Daniel has proven himself, and now King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the known world, has now put Daniel in charge over all, everything. He's in charge now. Not even Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is going to go back to bed. <laughs> He's going to go back to his throne. He can entrust Daniel now with everything. He's the chief administrator. And he's over all of those wise men. He is, they now answer to him. He's over all of them. 
So now what does Daniel do? Well, it's about time I got recognized. No. Verse 49, last verse. Also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs, now watch this, of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king, the most prominent place and position in all of the kingdom. So what does he do for his friends? Well, he gets them a promotion too, not at the level that he's promoted, because he's over all of them, over all of the, everything, chief administrator. But he says, hey, my three friends, can, can I, he petitioned the king. He's asking the king, king, if it would please you, king, can I, my, my three friends here that you've renamed, <laughs> can they be put over the affairs? Can you kind of promote them and position them? And the king agrees, and they're now over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But notice the distinction uh, and the differentiation between them and Daniel. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king in this high seat. Now why am I emphasizing this? Because again next week, and you're not going to make me teach chapter 3 tonight, but next week we're going to see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into that seven times hotter fiery furnace. And Daniel isn't there. And the typology is breathtaking. And I submit to you that in Daniel chapter 3, like all of the Old Testament scripture and typology, is a magnificent picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. Can I, can I just give you one, since we talked about Joseph, can I bring Joseph back in? And then we'll close. Is that okay? All right. You know, Joseph is also a type. In fact, arguably, he is the type of Jesus more than Moses, Isaac, all of these great, these were, these were, I hate it when, I'm, that's strong. Let me rephrase. I'm supposed to be a loving pastor. I, I don't like it when people say Bible characters. See, that was a lot better, wasn't it, than I hate. Hate's really strong. Why do you not like it when people say Bible characters? Because you're fictionalizing it. You're making it sound like, well, who's your favorite Bible character? What are you talking about? Is this a cartoon? No, these were real people, man. They put on their, well, they didn't wear jeans, but they put on their pants or robes or whatever, the same way we did, do. They were people like you and me. In fact, we have scripture that even says as much. In the context of Elijah, he prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain. He prayed that it would rain and it did rain. And, and you know, you, well, that's Elijah. Well, wait a minute. He, Elijah's just like you. Don't, don't, don't. We, 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 easy for me to say. We look at people like Joseph. We look at people like Daniel. We, I just brought Elijah into the discussion. Come on in, Elijah. I mean, we look at all these men and women mightily used of God, and we just, we disconnect ourselves from them because we just fancy them as being just, well, yeah, God could use them, but little old me. No, that's what they thought. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> little old me. Yeah, you. I'm going to use you. Me? Yeah. That way they'll know it's not you. They're going to know it's me, because they're going to look at you and go, it wasn't him. It had to be God. That's First Corinthians 3. I mean, God chooses the foolish to confound the wise and the weak to shame the strong. I think I got it backwards. You know the passage. Why does He do it like that? So that He alone gets the glory. So people don't look at you and go, well, of course, of course, you're Daniel, you're Elijah, you're Moses. 
and Joseph, who else do we want to invite to this party? <laughs> I mean, but no, they were, in fact, I love it when I hear people talk about, you know, in heaven, man, I can't wait to meet Noah. We just invited Noah into the party too. Oh man, I can't wait to meet Abraham, the, th this great man of faith. I can't wait to meet him. Have you ever thought about it like this? I love this. Have you ever thought about Abraham can't wait to meet you? No, think about it. <laughs> I mean, we're alive as that final generation at the end of time. I think they want to meet us like, dude, what was that like, man? Because <laughs> I know for, for us it was you know, back in the olden days. <laughs> but you guys were there at the end of days. Wow. Is that weird? <laughs> Good. So I was actually going somewhere very profound with this, and then we were going to, oh, Joseph, pre-tribulation rapture. You ready? Okay. There was a famine. You know how many years it was? Seven. You be careful with the fingers. Seven. I'm not doing the Satan sign, nothing like that, Masonic, nothing. Seven years of famine. Oh, uh, didn't Pharaoh have a dream? Yeah. Didn't Joseph interpret it? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Joseph didn't have to tell Pharaoh what the dream was. He just had to interpret it unlike Daniel. Daniel is the only one recorded in Scripture that we know of that actually was revealed what the dream was before he interpreted it. So Joseph has a dream. Where's, Pharaoh has a dream. Where's Joseph? He's stuck in the, in the dungeon, forgotten about. After interpreting the dreams of the baker and the butler, as they're affectionately referred to. And they, they have dreams. They're very disturbed. Joseph's going, by the way, I can help you out with that. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, the baker, dude, I'm so sorry. It doesn't end well for you. You're going to die, and he dies. But the butler, you're going to be the cupbearer of Pharaoh again. And by the way, when you're restored to your position, will you put in a good word for me? And he totally forgets about him. But God hasn't. So God gives Pharaoh this dream of seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. And he's up all night along with Neb Nebuchadnezzar, can't sleep. I, what, is, what does this mean? And here's the butler, the cupbearer going, you know what, ah, there's a guy I, I, that, can, that knows. Well, go get him. Where is he? Well, he was accused falsely of, you know, attempted rape. He's in, well, get him out, bring him here. He tells him, makes him the most powerful man in the world. But here's what's interesting in the typology. Like with Daniel, a picture of the church and the pre-tribulation rapture, he's exalted and taken up before the seven times hotter fiery furnace. Joseph took a Gentile bride before the seven year famine pre-tribulation rapture. I told you, I don't need a banana to find a pre-tribulation rapture. That's the typology. That's what's in store for us next week. That's just the prophetic part. How about the application? Oh man. Okay, last thing, and then that's the only thing you're getting out of me tonight. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tell Nebuchadnezzar, when they refused to bow down to this image, 60 cubits by 6 cubits, but with six instruments. Okay, that's it. And they say, you know, um, our God is able to deliver us. But if not, He will deliver us from you because we're never going to bow down and worship this image. That's revelation and the image of the beast. And either way, we're getting delivered. 
if you throw us in the fire and we're burned to death, at least we're delivered from you. Either way we're delivered. God is able to deliver us. Now He is going to deliver them from the fiery furnace. God will deliver you from, I'm already doing it. That's it. Capone, get up here. Stand up. That's all you're getting. You have to come next week to be continued. Don't you hate those series when they, anyway. Isn't God's Word exciting? How alive is God's Word? Lord, thank You for Your Word. <laughs> thank You for Daniel. Thank You for this record that we have in our Bibles of what happened. Only You could do this, God. And here we are all these generations later, studying, learning, understanding how You control the future. You hold the future. We don't know what the future holds, as one said, but we know who holds the future. And we have nothing to worry about. We know how it ends. And that settles us knowing that You're the God who knows the end from the beginning, and You've let us in on what You know. So that settles us. And for that, Lord, we thank You. And it, it causes us to be at peace, that peace from You, the God of peace. Because You've already told us how it's going to end. And it ends very well for us. <laughs> and here we are at the end. So Lord, thank You. Thank You for Daniel. Thank You for this. Thank You for this study. Thank You for this book. Thank You for this man. In Jesus' name, Amen.